You know, I really don't like to talk about the past because I've had, well, so much of it, I suppose. But there are a lot of archaeologists, and they're extremely young, terribly young. But they're so terribly interested in the past and what the 20s were like and what the 30s were like and what the 40s were like. And, of course, they ring my doorbell, as you can well imagine, because I seem to be, uh, well, just a few of us left, I guess. Their main interest, beside, of course, as I said, of the old pictures, it's so curious to find that uh, the young ones seem to be more interested in the era of the 20s than, let's say, my contemporaries. But they're especially interested in uh, Queen Kelly. I suppose there's a curiosity about it because it was just never finished. And also the fact that it was um, directed by one of our great directors, Eric von Stroheim. Well, I've been asked uh, a lot of questions, and I'm going to try and remember them. Had I ever worked, for instance, with von Stroheim before? No, I'd never had that pleasure. Uh, he'd made such great pictures, and I was rather in awe of this gentleman. I had never uh, met him even socially. I suppose in the time that I was there, and I have to speak of the 20s, although I didn't leave until the end of 38 when I moved to New York, uh, there were sort of stratas. Uh, and uh, the people that I moved with um, were certain people like Mary Pickford, Doug Fairbanks, Charlie Chaplin, and that's perhaps because we were all belong to the United Artists. Uh, von Stroheim, I think, made pictures mostly at uh, Universal and then later at MGM. And uh, when it came to uh, producing pictures myself, I had made, my first one was Sonia, then uh, Sadie Thompson, and then I was looking for a story. And I cannot remember whether von Stroheim came to me or I probably sent someone to him to find out if he had something tucked away that he might want to do. And uh, it was written by him, Queen Kelly. And I must also tell you, because I'm sure many of you don't realize that these were the days of, um, well, we had some scandals. Uh, and we had a man called Will Hayes. We called him the Tsar. And we were all in awe of him, because if he said no, we just didn't do it. I'm talking about censorship now. There was a great feeling around the country, too, that uh, Hollywood wasn't just what it should be. There had been the Arbuckle scandal, there had been uh, the murder of uh, Mr. Taylor, the director, and a few other things that uh, were not very attractive. And uh, so it was that he and his office had to okay all of the um, stories that, that were made. I think there were also women's clubs and organizations that were trying to stop Hollywood from... Here's an example. For instance, you couldn't show anyone knitting a booty because that would mean that one of the cast was pregnant, even though that was part of the story, where you just didn't... You weren't pregnant. That Nobody had children, I guess. And uh, such things as that. And people often said, well, why are you always making fairy stories in California? You don't have reality. Well, it was because we couldn't. Now, the stage is something else again. There, and novels were, oh, well, I can remember. Now, I'm going to digre uh, digress, and I mustn't, because Eleanor Glynn, remember, wrote the, f the um, Three Weeks, and that was considered a very naughty story in those days, censored, of course. Now, of course, I suppose they'd read it in kindergarten. But going back to um, Will Hayes's office, he had okayed the script of Queen Kelly, as written by Mr. von Stroheim, and Mr. von Stroheim was, um, well, he had a sort of mind of his own. So when he came to um, making the picture, he didn't follow the script just exactly. Now, since I was producing it and I was responsible for the money, 
because in those days no one knew, well they still don't use their own money uh, they go to the bank or they go to some organization just for this sort of thing I was responsible for it but I was trying desperately not to have anything to do with the production well, I might have said yes I think he's a nice looking man we'll have him for the leading man um, or I might have said, oh, I'm so glad we're going to have Cena Owen because she was suggested. But beyond that, I tried to stay away from it and just come on the set when uh, I was supposed to do my own scenes. So they, we did have two men that were going to supervise in a way in the background. One was named Barney Glazer. He had been associated with Mr. Von Stroheim when he was making The Merry Widow. And he was supposed to be able to handle Mr. Von Stroheim. I've heard about people being, you know, following me around to to handle me. We're all supposed to be some kind of pixies that need handling. And uh, so we asked him to come on the picture uh, to sort of mm, kind of in the background watch that nothing went wrong. And then there was another gentleman by the name of um, Bar uh, Bill Barron. He was the first, incidentally, he was the first producer in motion pictures because there was no such animal in the days when I started. And he was here at the Long Island Astoria studio. And he was, he saw, he oversaw all of the pictures that were made. And he was a man of the theater. So between these two, they were going to watch Mr. Von Stroheim. In other words, that he wouldn't uh, digress from the script that he had written. Well, I have a few minutes, I'll come back to this. Uh, but in the meantime, I want to tell you something very strange that happened. The exteriors were made in uh, Griffith Park, where so many of them were made from all, all pictures seem to go out there for exteriors. And the first scenes that you're going to see on this picture have to do with the Conran girls, which I'm one, and uh, the young Prince Charming. And uh, while I was making up, or powdering my nose, they had built a tent for me for my dressing room. And I had with me a house guest. Uh, we had met uh, at the SNA when I first started pictures in Chicago, and she uh, was there in my dressing room with me. And also there was a little woman by the name of Ann Morgan, who had been brought over by Eleanor Glynn. And um, she was sort of my dresser. She was in a, in a nun's costume because of her lovely face. They wanted her to be in the picture just as sort of atmosphere. Well. As I'm pouting my nose, waiting for them to call me, uh, they had been doing some scenes with a prince, I was looking in the mirror, and I kept saying, uh, oh, isn't this strange? I can't see this picture finished. Well, the little Anne Morgan, little tiny woman, said, oh, but madam, what do you mean? Uh, are you going to die? And I started to laugh and said, no, no, you can't kill me. I No, it has nothing to do with that, but I don't know what I mean. I just... I can't see this picture finished. Miss Swanson, you're wanted on the set, and off I went. All right, time passes. Quite some months passed, I should think about nine or ten months. And meantime, my friend had gone back to Chicago and returned, and she's now in my dressing room, and instead of being on the uh, RKO lot, where we finally made some interiors of Queen Kelly, we're now at Pathé, and I'm in my bungalow, and this girl, whose name is Virginia Bowker, said to me, Gloria, you know, so much has happened since I went back to Chicago. Uh, tell me, uh, do you remember what you said the first day of shooting? You hadn't yet made your first scene? And I said, well, besides a couple of thousand words, no, I, I have no idea what you're driving at. And she said, is Ann Morgan around? And I said, yes, yeah, she's in my, uh, in my workroom, sewing room. She said, come on, call her. And I did. So Ann Morgan came in and she said, uh, Ann Morgan, do you remember what Miss Swanson said just before she was called on the set at, um, she was in Griffith Park, first scene of the picture? Oh, 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 yes, I do, I do. She said, oh, I can't see this picture finished. And of course now the film rolls back in my own head and of course I remembered it. And I thought to myself, well, maybe I've got a crystal ball in my head and don't know it. But you know, I dwelt on that for quite some time because here I was now in the middle of my first talking picture called The Trespasser. And 
Actually, since the trespasser, I have tried to finish Queen Kelly no less than oh, four times. And so finally, I put a little tag, what you're going to see is an ending that I put on it because I wanted to release it to some of the theaters that yet didn't have sound equipment and let some people see it. And now, of course, it's in the archives. It's in all the museums now around the, the world, and many people see it, but not with the version that you will see. In France, they um, ran it without my ending, because I think von Stroheim preferred that, and he was then alive. And in England, if you please, they have found some of the cutout scenes uh, in Africa, which were the censored scenes, and they've put that on the end of it. So there are going to be quite many versions, I imagine, depending on how many hands have been on it. But what you are going to see shortly, I hope you will enjoy. You have now just seen a little more than half. And I imagine we have spent about, up to this point in the picture, about $400,000, most of which you saw on the banquet table. Real caviar, real champagne, you can be sure. You know, which reminds me of Mr. DeMille. That's what he did. He, was, he never wanted anything fake, and so when I was wearing diamonds, they were not paste. When I was wearing ermine, it was not rabbit skin. And I have an idea that uh, Mr. Von Stroheim was trying to be like Mr. DeMille. At any rate, um, at this point, we had shot a great deal of film, because this is one of... Uh, Mr. von Stroheim's failings of taking a scene, no matter whether it's cigars in an ashtray and spending hours on it. And I think that's why we had probably spent so much money up to this particular point. But now we'll go into the next portion of Queen Kelly, and then when we come back, I'll tell you more about, well, what happened when we finally uh, decided not to finish it. Well, now you have seen the unfinished version of Queen Kelly. And to finish the story I started before, by this time you've seen about $600,000 has been spent. And the pity of it is that, um, well, I, I should say that I'm more fortunate than those who uh, spend that amount of money on a lovely, beautiful musical, as so many producers have on Broadway, like the Berlin musical. And they open and they close, and that's the end of it. Nobody even sees it after that. At least Queen Kelly has had some life, and uh, there's still an interest, and I suppose there would be in the, in the plays if somebody had preserved them. That's why I'm so grateful to uh, this wonderful invention that we can preserve so many things of an era, if not of, uh, of a career. Now, what you did not see was the part that was censorable. And uh, we went from this convent period when you saw me commit suicide, presumably, jump into the river. The story went that I was rescued, taken to the convent, and then the nuns told me that they had received word from my aunt in Africa, and I was to go there immediately because she was dying. So that when the prince wanted to find me, he only heard that I had gone to Africa. And the story continues in Africa. I would say that, according to the script, there was probably almost two-thirds of the story took place in Africa. Now, my aunt, when we took these scenes, was supposed to be the owner of a nightclub, night a dance hall type of thing. That was the script that uh, Mr. Will Hayes had okayed. But by the time uh, Mr. von Stroheim um, got in there and uh, felt a free hand, maybe those other two boys weren't watching him, it wasn't exactly a dance hall. It was sort of one of those things that they long ago closed up in the United States. I'm not sure where they have them now in the rest of the world. They used to be in France, but I don't think they're there either anymore. 
And you can imagine my consternation when I walked on the set and saw what was going on, and also it was early in the morning, and Marshall Tully, I think his name was, he always played rather creepy kind of characters, and he's chewing tobacco and dropping it on my hand. I don't think I would have enjoyed it even at five in the afternoon, so I uh, excused myself, so Mr. Von Stroheim excused me, and I went to my bungalow, and I called New York immediately and said, you better get out here but fast to the people who were concerned and who had been lending me the money, bankers. I don't think we have a picture because a lot of it's going to be on the cutting room floor because Will Hayes' office did not okay this version. <clears throat> Plus the fact that we have 20,000 feet of the first third, and how we're going to cut that down and make any sense, I don't know. And then I relaxed. And, of course, everybody rushed out there. There was a lot of hysterics and a great deal of... I, I never saw, incidentally, Mr. Von Stroheim from that day until I went backstage, oh, many years later, I think in the 40s, when he was doing Arsenic and Old Lace, and said hello to him. We never mentioned Queen Kelly. And then the next time I saw him was when he was on the set, Sunset Boulevard, playing Max. Well, I can tell you that there were a lot of wonderful friends who tried desperately to help me out in my plight, writers, directors, from every studio imaginable, and I'd ask them to go into the projection room and see what we had, and I must say that they'd come out blaspheming, saying, what is he being doing? What is, why, this is censorable, of course, blah, blah. And everybody tried to give us a new version so we could stay away from that dance hall. Well, after spending now another 200,000 on the various versions, Mr. Boleslavsky was one of the directors brought in. We even thought maybe we could make it a dream. Then there was a little talk of a, about sound. There was such a thing as, oh, sound was coming in. Maybe I could sing a song in it, or perhaps I could have one reel of it. But somehow, it, this Queen Kelly gal was a, was a child that somehow didn't want to be born. And finally, I was meeting surreptitiously with a man called Edmund Goulding. You've seen many of his films. He had a fantastic mind. It was like this all the time. And he had an idea. And I latched onto it like a sinking woman, uh, onto a straw. And it was called, going to be called, The Trespasser. And so within three weeks, with Laura Hope Crew's help, Eddie Goulding and myself, and a court stenographer, the script of The Trespasser was written in my home. Thank goodness, it was a success. And from the profits of the trespasser, the bankers were paid the $800,000, I think with interest. Now, wherever you are, von Stroheim, who knows? But it was a matter I it was out of my hands because of censorship. So there's Mr. Will Hayes and he are both in the same place, I'm sure, and I think they ought to try and work this out, because now the way things go and what we see on the screen and television and in the streets and the newspapers, I think anything goes. So it would seem, and maybe if we, it were today, the dance hall problem would have been nothing. So I guess it's timing. And I've taken up a lot of time. And I'm glad to say greetings to you. And thank you for watching. And happy hearts to all of you.